Hey everyone and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. In this episode we have James who wanted to share his Bigfoot experiences. He was floating on the current river and decided to camp off of a gravel bar near an area called Cave Spring. The area is known for its super cold and clear water, the wildlife, and vast forests that spread for endless miles. During the summertime, the rivers in Missouri become a lot more crowded and congested and many people like to canoe and kayak the waterways. But when the sun goes down and people get off of the river, those left camping on its banks will experience a different side of the forest that was not seen or heard during the daylight hours. Alright guys, with all of that being said, let's dive into this next Bigfoot experience that took place at Cave Spring, Missouri off of the current river. All right, James, welcome to Sasquatch Theory. How are you doing today? I'm very good, how are you? Oh, I'm doing excellent. James, if you would start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and this Bigfoot experience that you had in the Ozark Scenic Waterways here in Missouri. Okay, well, as you know, my name is James. Um, I live in central, south central Missouri. Uh, not too far outside of the uh, Houston area, and uh, the the location that this ex experience, if you will, occurred was on the current river uh, with my son. We were uh, canoeing and camping overnight on the current river um, at a location that I actually camp every single year at the same spot. Um, it's a very popular spot. Anyone that has ever been on the current river. Uh, we'll know the location. It is it's known as Cave Spring. Uh, it's a very popular stop stopping point on the river. People during the daytime will stop there by the hundreds and just play around in the, in the water because it's so crystal clear and cold. It's a it's a beautiful location. Um, but at nighttime, it's just silent. There's no one around. Um, this location is very remote. Uh, you can, there's only two ways you can actually access it. One is by canoe. And the other is by, there's, there's a trail across the river uh, that it's about a one mile trail that if you stop at a location known as Devil's Well, uh, you can park your car there, visit the, the Devil's Well, but there's a trail, about a one mile trail that will actually take you all the way over the mountain down into the valley where the river is and it'll take you right to this location. But again, um, Miguel, it is a very remote place. There, there's no way, there's no roads. There's no, uh, other than that one trail that takes you to that park, there's nothing in this area. Um, so the, uh, the first thing that ever happened out there, Miguel, was actually about eight years ago. Um, like I said, I, I camped at the same spot every year. I usually go in the spring, sometimes in the fall, sometimes both each year. Um, I like going in the off season, so you're not fighting all the crowds like during the summertime this this river is packed with so many tourists and like college students and stuff come down to the area and they float this river so it's a very popular spot um but in the off season like spring and fall it's pretty pretty quiet and it's great because the weather's better for for camping and uh the river it's just it's just a more private experience it's a much more enjoyable experience in, in the off season so uh about eight years ago I was out there camping at this location. I had my daughter and her friend with me. And um, we pretty much do the exact same thing every time. We, we, we put the canoe in the, in the river right around noon, sometimes 11. And we float down to our camp spot, which is about, about a six hour float, five to six hours. You get there, you know, you set up your tent, you build a fire and we have dinner. And then usually talk about the day and all the wildlife and the things we saw. And, and then we, we go to sleep. Um, so about eight years ago, we we were asleep. In the, it was probably the middle of the night. It had to be, I don't know for sure what time, but it was definitely the middle of the night. Uh, my daughter was asleep. Her friend was asleep. And I was awakened by what sounded to me like someone walking across the river. Like it was a two, two-legged, so it's not like somebody walking across the river. And I was laying there, my, my, the two kids were asleep, but I'm laying there listening to this and I'm thinking who in the world would be dumb enough to walk across this river in the middle of the night? I mean, it's the current river has a pretty, pretty strong, strong current. That's why it's you know known as the current river. Um, 
So it's, it's not easy to walk across that river. It's just, there's some spots where it's shallow and it's easy, but this particular location, the current's moving pretty fast. And then it's easy to get, you know, swept away, like pushed down the river. So I was laying there thinking who in the world would be dumb enough to walk across this river in the middle of the night. Um, and so I just laid there listening to it. It walked all the way across the river and then I didn't hear anything, any, anything else after that. Like it, once it got out of the water, I didn't hear it anymore. Like I didn't hear any sticks breaking. I didn't hear any rocks getting, you know, crunched together or anything. Um, and the place where I actually set up my tent is on a rock bar. This rock bar is a good 200 foot long, probably about 30 to 40 foot wide. And it's just gravel and rock. It's got a little bit of sand, but my, my point is it's rock. And so if you walk on that gravel or as rock, you can hear it. You know, you can hear footsteps walking through uh, like across this rock bar. I never heard anything at all, Miguel. So whatever it was, it walked across the river and it, it just went up into the, the forest. Never heard it again. Well, the next morning we got up and packed up all of our stuff and packed it, put it all in a canoe like normal. I did not mention it to the kids because I did not want to freak them out. I just, okay, I just kept it to myself. So we got in the canoe, we shoved off. And the way I always shove off, uh, Miguel, is I actually take the paddle uh, and I actually push it in the rocks and like shove the, the, the canoe out. And I do that until I can't hit, you know, I can't touch the bottom anymore with my paddle and then we start actually paddling. So I shoved out, we got out about probably 10, maybe 15 feet from the shore. And that was the exact area where I heard the sound of, of the walking, like someone walking across the river. And here's what really kind of like freaked me out is my paddle is 54 inches. It's a aluminum plastic uh, canoe paddle, just an average paddle. It is 54 inches. So when I went to shove that paddle down again, or where I heard that the, the, the sound of someone walking across the river, I underwater before I touched the, the rock. And that, that kind of freaked me out because I'm like, okay, I know where I heard that sound. I know where it was so close to our tent, it was distinguishable, like the exact location. So this 54 inch paddle went completely underwater before I hit the bottom. So now I'm thinking, okay, this doesn't make any sense because I'm an average sized guy. I've got a 34 inch uh, inseam like on my pants. This thing was 20 inches. My paddle's 54, so that's 20 inches more taller, if you will. So now my brain is like going what in the world i mean who that person had to have been eight foot nine foot tall for me to be able to hear the legs moving through the water you know what i'm saying it, it was a swish 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 so you could hear both legs moving through the water and i was just thinking to myself that's impossible there's no one big enough you know that's just impossible um uh, i put on my brain I, I just forgot about it i thought that's weird. You know, I can't explain it. Weird thought. I don't know what happened. And I just went on with my life. Never even worried about it. Um, I started listening to uh, Sasquatch Chronicles about probably two years after that, after my, uh, my my brother had actually suggested I, you know, listen to the program. He, he believed in Sasquatch and I personally did not. I, I thought it was, I thought it was somebody in a costume somewhere that filmed like the, the old Patterson film. The original film um you know i saw it as a kid growing up but i just figured it was like made up i didn't i didn't even believe it i figured it was just somebody in a costume so anyways he talked to me to start to, to listening to the program and i started listening to it and uh i found i found a lot of the the call-ins like interesting i mean some of the some of the reports i i can't say that i believe them some of them i thought sounded very legitimate other ones not so much so I was kind of on the fence, I guess, at, at that point, listening to it. But everything changed when I listened to one of his programs where he had a guy on there that this guy, I don't know if he was a researcher or what, but this guy would take a four-wheeler and he would go down into like the deep forest and he would pull a little trailer, like a little enclosed trailer behind him. And what he would do is he would set up uh, basically a, a fake campsite. Like he would set up a tent build a fire and he put, I, don't know, I can't remember if he put like a lantern there or, or what, but basically he would build a campsite. And then what he would do is he would go 
and hide inside of that little trailer that he was pulling behind his um, his uh, foiler. And then he would just observe and re- take recordings and try to get images of these creatures if they were, you know, if they would come in near the, the campsite. But he had, he caught on his, his recorder the sound of one of these things walking across the river. And it was the, ex- <laughs> my mind like shot back, like raced back immediately to that occurrence, what had happened to us on the river, because I could hear it in his recording that swish 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 sound and it just brought me right back and i thought wow i wonder (laughs) that was the first first thing that really made me think that maybe these things are out there and again that was eight years ago probably maybe maybe nine it was around eight years ago i'm sure um so that was the first thing that ever happened miguel um the second thing that happened out there was probably six years ago Uh, i was actually camping with the father of my daughter's friend who I'd taken with us camping. Uh, he went home so excited. He was telling his dad about how much fun he had. His dad actually approached me and said, Hey, you know, would you be willing to, to take me out there with you? Because he, he's like, sound like a good time. So I agreed to it. He had a kayak. I've got a canoe. And so we just went out there together. We hauled him out there and did the same float. I always, always, always take. Um, so that night, <laughs> Same, again, same spot, Miguel. I camp at the exact same rock bar every time. So we're sitting there we're by the campfire, and it's probably, I don't know, it's probably 8 o'clock in the evening, something around there. Uh, the sun had not gone down completely, but it, it was it was starting to go over the hills. So you're in a valley in this particular spot. So the sun, you know, it goes over the hill pretty, pretty early, and it starts to get dark in the valley. So it, it was probably, I'm going to guess, 8, something like that. We're sitting there by the fire eating, and we're just sitting about three foot apart, having a conversation, just talking normal, normal volume. And while we were talking, we we heard this incredibly loud, like scream, that turned into a, a roar. So it was like a very long, loud, like scream. When I say scream, it, I imagine like a football player in the locker room, like pumping up his teammates, like screaming, you're like really loud. That, that was kind of what it was like, a, yeah, like something like that. But then it went straight into like a, a roar at the end of it. it. There was no pause. There was no separation. It just went straight from a scream to a roar. And it was so loud that we, we both stopped <laughs> and we're like looking at each other. We were listening to this thing. When it finally shut up, I, I asked him like, what the hell was that? And he was <laughs> He was just like me. He was like, I have no idea. I have no idea what that was. So it kind of rattled us both, but we just, we kept on, you know, eating our dinner because we thought it sounded about probably a quarter mile, like uh, north of like our location, um, off in the forest. It was behind us. It wasn't on the opposite side of the river. It was on the side of the river that we were camped on. So it was just like a forest area behind us. So we, we, we kept eating. We were talking a little more and then probably about, I'm going to say 20 minutes later, it did it again, like the same exact scream in a roar. But this time, Miguel, it was followed by two very distinct shotgun blasts, like boom, boom. It just it was like, like you like you had a pump 12 gauge and you had one in the chamber and one that you racked. That was about the distance between the fire, the shots. It was a boom, boom. And then silence. We didn't hear anything. We didn't hear another scream. We didn't hear any voices, nothing. We just heard two shotgun blasts, and that was it. So that kind of freaked us out to the point that we actually decided we're going to go to bed because it was kind of, it, it rattled both of us. So we got in a tent, went to sleep, nothing else happened. Um, when I got home from that trip, I got on uh, online, I went on the Google Earth because I wanted to see, like, if there was a house up there or a cabin or something because I knew where the screen came from. I knew I could tell the location. So I went on Google Earth, pinpointed where we were camped and looked up, uh, basically did a whole, like a radius search in that whole area. And Miguel, there's, there's nothing there. There is no homes. There's no cabins. There's no roads. There's, there's nothing. But I did figure out that it is a state park. In fact, I didn't even, I had never even heard of the park before, but it's called Sunk Lands. And it is the largest state park in the state of Missouri. 
It's like 40,800 and I think 60 acres or something around there. It's huge. But it is a um, very remote and isolated state park. Like if you if you go online, which I sent you links so you can share this with your audience after we're done talking, um, Sunk Lands, if you look it up, not only is it a state park, but it has a very large portion within the park that is known as a natural area. In other words, it's a like virgin forest, old growth. Uh, I don't know that it was ever even logged. Um, I do know from looking at their website that uh, there are log trails on the on the state park property, but those are not accessible uh, by like by the public. We you and I can't can't utilize those those log trails like with a vehicle or four wheeler. It's off limits to us. The state uh, rangers and the people that work at the park they use those log trails to I guess move you know move around the park, but for you and I, the public, we're not allowed to, uh, you can't have a four wheelers out there. You can't have side by sides. Um, there's, there's the only way you can access this park, Miguel, is to actually hike in. It's like a primitive hiking uh, camping only. That's it. So you have this incredibly large park. And so I, after I, after I realized all that, I thought, man, it, it had to be, it had to have been campers. It had to be. This state park is massive. And where I heard that those, the scream roar and then the gunshots, that was right from this area, like in that park. So it had to be somebody camping. There's no homes. There's no cabins. You know what I mean? So anyways, so that was the second thing that happened out there, Miguel. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, I camp out there like every year. So sometimes spring, sometimes fall, sometimes both. Um, it, it has happened numerous times where I will hear large rocks being thrown into the river. And I mean, bit like big rocks, not pebbles. I mean, like something, um, something close to the size of like a soccer ball, like a big rock. And that, that will happen a lot out there. Like you'll be, you'll, and it almost always happens like when you first lay down. It's like you, you'll, you'll lay down, you'll be in a tent for, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then you'll hear this boom, like a big splash rock hitting the water. And it's weird because you're like, okay, that's it happens. It, 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 it happens frequently at this location. The other thing that I've, I've uh, had happen out there numerous times is uh, wood knocks, like an actual, uh, it sounds like you, you've got like a, an ax handle or something, like a hickory handle, and you're just smacking it against a tree. You'll, you'll hear that once in a while. And usually there's two of them. You'll hear one, and then you'll hear a second one within just a few seconds, like downriver from each other. So that happens quite a bit out there. Um, and I had shared all of these experiences with my family. Like after I started listening to Sasquatch Chronicles, started becoming more familiar with the habits, if you will, or behaviors of these things, I started becoming a, more of a believer that, hey, you know what? They, <laughs> if, they, if they do exist, they're probably in this location because there's a lot of things that I had heard reports uh, you know, from other people's experiences that are very similar. These same things happen out there at this location. So I had shared these things with my family and they were quite honestly, they, they were kind of nervous. They like, they didn't even like me going out there anymore because, you know, if, if these things do exist, they thought, you know, they could, they could, they could hurt you. Um, so, so my family was kind of uh, skittish about me going out there. Um, and I, I, other than those screams and roars that time, I, I never really felt like fear out there. I guess it was kind of more of like a curiosity thing to me. Like, I wonder, you know, I, I, I kind of wonder if they're real. Um, so I, I kept going. My, uh, a good buddy of mine, um, we would go out there uh, like every year in camp. And he, he actually was into the Sas Sasquatch thing too. I, like I shared that, that show with him. And so he started listening to it. And he actually brought like a little, uh, what do they call them? Little parabolic, like, recorders you know what i'm talking about it's like a little uh parabolic microphone it's like a little radar dit. yeah there you go yeah he brought he brought one of those out there with like a digital recorder because he was just curious if if he would catch anything so he, he turned it on left it on all night and uh the only thing that he did catch was a wood knock you, you could hear a very distinct wood knock and he was actually reviewing the recordings the next next week or whatever um but but the um i, I never had like a fear you know what I mean, Miguel? I, I was I was kind of like a little a little anxious, maybe a little bit nervous, but never like fear. Well, this year, 
uh, we decided to go camping out there, but we went in August. So just a little over a month ago, we, uh, they were, there was, it was kind of an odd weekend. Like the weather was not normal for Missouri. Normally in, in August, it's hot as to be out here. Like you're sweating, the humidity's sky high and it's, you know, 90, sometimes even a hundred degrees out here. But there was one weekend in August this year that it was like mild. It was only, I think the high was 80 that weekend. And the, the nights were in like the 60s. It was like perfect camping weather. So my wife suggested that I take the son, my son and we go, you know, go camping that weekend because um, I was getting ready to get really busy at work. And she she figured I would probably wouldn't have time to go camping with him if if I waited you know too much longer. So we went. We did it. We decided, yes, yeah, let's, let's go this weekend. My son was a little nervous about going just because of the things I'd shared with him that had happened out there. But I talked him into it. I talked him into it. I looked, you know, even if they're even if they're out there, you know, they're they're off in the distance. They're up up in those hills, up in the the, the state park area. They they don't come down here to the river. I, I, that's what I told my son. And I'm an idiot, absolute idiot for telling him that because I actually believe that. That's why I told him that. But after our experience, what I'm going to share with you guys, no, <laughs> they do come down to the river, and I had no idea that they would actually come down there, like with people there. Um, the, the biggest difference between this camping trip and the other camping trips I take or have taken is we went in August, like right at, towards the end of August where school had already started back up. So families, you know, family vacations are over, kids are back in school. There were hardly, there was hardly anyone on the river. Like when we went, when we put our canoe in the, in the river on Friday, uh, and started paddling there, we, we hardly crossed anybody's path at all. There was like no one hardly on the river. And typically when we go camping, a lot of the locals go in the spring and fall for the same reason I told you a while ago that it is, it's quiet. It's much more enjoyable when you're not fighting crowds of you know people. It literally, sometimes that river will be so crowded. There'll be uh, like almost bottleneck. It's crazy. There'll be so many canoes and so many floating tubes and rafts that it's hard, it's hard to even paddle. Sometimes you literally are like running into each other. So most of the locals around here, they don't go to the river in the summer because nobody wants to fight the crowds. So typically in the fall, in the spring, that's when the local people go out and most of us have our own equipment. So we don't have to go rent canoes. We don't rent kayaks. We don't rent any of that stuff. So we're on our own schedule. Miguel, have you ever been canoeing or floating? Yeah. Yeah. I go floating here on the Merrimack okay. River. Okay, perfect. So you know what I'm talking about when I when I when I'm speaking of the uh, like the, the rental places, right? Like they they the first of all they have a season because of the crowds, so they don't even operate, you know, past a certain point of the year because it's, they're they're not going to you know make enough money off of it. But but here's the deal for those for those of the audience that are not familiar with floating or canoeing, the uh, rental places have times. So like you show up, you pay your rental fee. They've got a whole bunch of canoes and kayaks lined up on the river. You go down, you hop in your kayak or canoe, and you float. And then you float down to a certain place, location, where they will actually pick you up and then drive you back back to your car. So, in other words, you're on a schedule. Like, they have a drop time and a pickup time. If you miss the pickup time, you're going to sit there till the next pickup comes. And it might be two, three hours later. So, my point is... These people that rent canoes or kayaks, they are basically in a big group going from point A to point B. And and then in between those those uh, time slots, the river will be quiet again. There won't be that many people on the river. So if you have your own equipment, you're not on a schedule. In other words, you can get up as early as you want and hit the river, which we do every time. Because the cool thing about being on the river with your own equipment, you get up at like you know, seven o'clock or even six thirty, you're on the water as, as the, the river starting to lighten up. And the, the the best part about that, Miguel, is you get to see ninety percent of the wildlife that, that's out there because there's no one interrupting them. There's 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 been no canoers go by them yet. So the animals will be right there near the water. You'll see deer, otter, elk, um, bears, foxes. I mean. <laughs> You name it, they'll be down by the water early in the morning because no one's around. It's quiet. And so if, if you're quiet paddling, like just silently floating or, or quietly paddling, you can sneak right up on them. And most of the time they won't even know you're there until you're right beside them. So it's 
it's kind of a cool experience. Um, but so I'm sharing all that with you because I want you to know that this this year was different. We, we, when we went camping, it was summer, but it was at the end of summer. So the crowds were gone. And the, the float that I take, Miguel, is like a 27-mile float. We, we, we break it up overnight. Obviously, we camp. But it's, it's a 27-mile float. So that um, on the entire 27 miles that we floated, I think we only counted it was either three or four campers on the river, which is highly, highly like <laughs> unusual. There's almost always, you know, somebody camping every every mile. It is, it's not uncommon to see two people, two different campsites per mile. But these, this year, it was so different. It was like there was no one on the river. So I'm sharing that with you because that, I think, had an impact on, on what happened to us. I don't think there was any... There wasn't, there was nobody around. And I think that these things, I don't know if they felt safe or uh, if it gave them some kind of ever to, to come all the way down to the river. But that's what happened. So my son and I, um, we got to our campsite just like normal, set up the, uh, the tent. I was actually setting up the tent and put our gear in the tent while my son was actually building the fire. Um, I got done a little bit before, before he did. So I kind of helped him with the fire to get it going. And then, uh, we had our, our dinner, like always, we talked about the day we, we saw a lot of wildlife on that float. So it was, we had a lot to talk about. It was kind of cool. Um, but we were sharing that, sharing our experience and just talking about it. And then we went to bed because it started getting dark. We laid down and we were, uh, this same thing happened as almost always. We were laid, laying there and was, we'd been in the tent probably, probably 20 minutes. And then here goes that big, big rock hitting the river again. And my son looked at me and he said, Dad, did you hear that? And I said, yeah, you know, I did. So that kind of, kind of, I wouldn't say spooked us, but it definitely kind of made us, it was, it was an uneasy feeling, Miguel. Like it was kind of like, okay, <laughs> they're here. Um, but nothing else happened. We went ahead and um, just kind of didn't worry about it, laid back down. And um, there's something I want to share with you right now, because directly behind my tent, where I, where I set the tent up, is like a little low water area. In other words, when the river comes up, it actually flows around this rock bar. You with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, it's, so when the river's down, it's just like a little low water area. In other words, it always has water in it. And it is full of bullfrogs and clams like every time i go camping uh we, we have like a little raccoon that will you, you'll hear him scurrying around out there and he's digging for clams because there's clam shells everywhere so i know he's out there digging for those clams but the bullfrogs there's a whole bunch of bullfrogs in that little water hole i'd say there's at least three large ones like adult ones and then you hear, and then you also hear like little ones you know but there's always at least three very like large bullfrogs and they will do, uh, they'll croak, like a normal croak. Like, I'm sure most of your audience, if not all your audience, is going to be familiar with how a bull, bullfrog's croak. It's, it's like an occasional croak. Like, it'll, like a, and it, you may, and seconds will go by, and then you'll hear another one. And then maybe, it, so it's, it's just, it's kind of occasional. And the frogs were doing that, just like they always do. They're, they're, they're literally 10 feet from the tent. That's how close this, this rock bar is only 40 foot wide. So the, the frogs were doing their normal croaking. And that, that's actually kind of soothing to me. That's one thing I love about camping is hearing the, the night sounds, the frogs, the bugs, the, it's just, it's peaceful. So it actually kind of puts me to sleep. So I'm laying there listening to the frogs. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm asleep. Well, I, I was woke up by this is about, it was about 3.45 to 4 o'clock in the morning. I know because I looked at my uh, phone and started recording stuff, which we're going get, to get into that later. So I know it was right around 3.45 to 4 o'clock when this first started. And what woke me up, Miguel, was it was a barred owl. And I sent you a link. Um, if you want to share that with your audience, it, the link is to a, a web page that has, I think it's 17 different night bird sounds. 
And if you scroll down to the Bard Owl, B-A-R-R-E-D, Bard Owl, listen to that recording. That is almost identical to what woke me up. It, this owl was like frantically calling out, like warning. It was, it was, it was right behind the tent, up in the trees, and it kept going from like tree to tree to tree to tree. You could hear it like jump and hit the limbs and like fly just to the next limb, the next tree, and it, it just kept screaming. It was making that exact same sound. It's like a woo, something like that. If you listen to that recording, it's 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 just it's very similar to that. But this owl was going back and forth, back and forth, and it was just screaming. It kept screaming. I was like, what the heck's going on? I'm, I'm laying there, and my son was asleep, and I'm listening to this bird like. What is he doing? And like, it would, I'm sure, Miguel, you've probably seen like birds freaking out before. Like, like a, maybe a, a mama bird like will have a, like a nest with some young ones in it or eggs, and like if a, another bird comes near it, the mom will start screaming and squawking and like throwing a fit. Or like if, if there's a snake up in the tree, same deal. The, the mother bird will be like going crazy. Are you are you with me on that, Miguel? Yeah, yeah, I've seen that before. Okay, okay. So that's what this owl was doing. It was like frantically going from tree to tree, screaming that same call. And I didn't even know what kind of owl it was. I was confident that it was an owl, but I had never heard one make that sound before. So I was trying to, that's how I, I actually found that, that link that I sent you. When I got home from this trip, I started looking up night bird sounds and, and I found it. I'm like, wow, that, that was definitely it. It was a barred owl. But um, anyways, the, the owl was like frantically doing this and it did it probably, I don't know, probably seven times, something like that. And then finally it, it flew off into the forest. I could hear it. Like it was still making that sound as it flew away. Okay. So as after that commotion was over, then I could hear the frogs. The frogs are again, no more than 10 feet from the tent, but they weren't doing a, like their normal occasional croak. It was, it was completely different. Again, it was, it was like a, one, two, three, four. Like they were going rook, 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 like that. And there would be one bullfrog doing a four count, and there was a second frog doing rook, rook, rook. So three counts. So you got one frog going four, the other one's going three. But here, here's what was bizarre, Miguel. After that owl flew away, I could hear these frog sounds, but I also heard like a duplicate sound. So I would hear a frog go, rut, 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 rut. And then I would hear a, what sounded, at first it sounded like just a repeat of the same thing, like four counts. I, I, I was just laying there listening to these sounds. It was bizarre. So the frogs would do, rut, 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 rut. And the second frog would be doing a, rut, rut, rut. But as soon as they would finish their croaks, you would immediately hear a repeat, one, two, three, four. And I'm just going to say that for now, because when, when you share these recordings with your audience, yeah, you're, you're gonna you're gonna hear it. I mean, it's it's bizarre. So at first, it was just I was just laying there confused, trying to understand like why are, why are these frogs doing this? This is not normal. I've never heard a frog bullfrog do like a, a four count beat or a three count beat and then repeat it over again. It just was it was bizarre. So as I'm laying there, I start noticing that the second set of, of beats was actually coming from the forest. So you got the frogs right there next to the tent making their croaks. And then out in the woods, you would hear a one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. But as, as, as I laid there, they started getting louder and louder. So whatever it was in the forest was coming down through the woods, was coming through the forest to the river. Now, the place that I camp on the river, Miguel, is like, I already told you, there's no way out of there. You, the only way out of there is by, by a canoe. Or if you want to swim across the river and get on that trail and then hike a mile to get to that uh, Devil's Well camp, uh, it's not even a campsite, it's just a day use park. Um, that's it. There's no other way out of there. So when you come to the river, your only option is to jump in the water and swim. There's nowhere else to go. So these things are coming down through the forest, making this repeated sound. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. And as they got closer, Miguel, I, I could tell they were, there was more than one. It was like there were multiple beats coming out of the forest and as they got closer and closer they you could you could literally start to 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 figure out that they were a certain distance apart now this is the middle of the night it's pitch black there's there's no light at all out there even if there was a moon out it was dark yeah you know, 
we, I, my tent has a, one of those um, oh, uh, weather shields over top of it, too. So it's always dark in the tent. Unless you turn on a light, it's, it's almost pitch black in there. Um, so all I had to uh, rely on was my ears. You know, I couldn't see anything. I could hear. But when you're in that situation, your ears, your hearing is much more, uh, I guess, intensified. Like you pay better attention in the dark than you do in the daylight. It's because you're focusing on the, your, your hearing so much more. And as these things came closer and closer to the camp, I could hear, you could start to tell like there's a distance between these things. They are some, at first it seemed like they were maybe a hundred feet apart, but as they got closer and closer to the, the camp, they started spreading out. And then you could, you could very distinctly, clearly tell that they were not only separated, but you could, you could count them. Like, because they were far enough apart, you could hear one smack, like, what, before you, when you hear the recordings, you're going to hear it. it what it was, um, Miguel, it was wood being hit on wood. I think, I could be wrong, but I think, I think these things had a stick in each hand, and they were hammering them together, like drumsticks. But they were coming down to the woods, and when they got, got close enough, you could, you could get, count them. Like, there was one, two, three, four, five, six. There was six of these things in separate areas. There were two that were relatively close to our like actual tent, probably, I don't know, 40 feet away, like one on each side, probably 100 foot apart. But then there was two more going down river and two more going up river along, along the wood line. And this is where we got, I was really getting like nervous at this point. You know, I was starting to worry. My son was still asleep. Um, I, I started getting like concerned that we were going to get attacked. So I started like texting. Well, I, I was actually like typing in a text format to my wife, what was happening because I've started to worry that, you know, we, we might get attacked. We might get hurt. We might get killed. We might go missing. And so I was hoping that someone would find this phone because there's no phone signal out there to go. None. If you know the area, there is no phone signal for miles. So the best I could hope for was that someone would find the phone and maybe get it, get, get it to my wife and she would at least be able to see, hopefully, what had happened or at least have an idea of what was going on and get, help her. With, you know, I was hoping she would have a foreclosure, to be honest with you. These things were coming down through the woods, Miguel, and as they were coming down and getting closer to the campsite, you could, you could hear them like, like the, the sound started to separate like they were they were actually what it, it seemed like to me Miguel is like they were actually spreading out throughout the woods but they were still moving forward towards the river so you had two down down river two very close to our campsite and then two up river so there was six of them and I'm sure of it because they were far enough apart that when they would hit the sticks together when they would beat the sticks you could absolutely tell the, the the location they were very far apart by the time they got to the actual river's edge so there it sounded like there was six of them and they were coming down towards the river but they're kind of spreading out and um triangulating around you or circling around you guys exactly they, they were actually moving in formation miguel like it was actually like a have you ever watched those uh like a discovery documentary or something where they show like how a lot of the tribal peoples hunt they'll they'll, they'll walk in a big row and they'll move through a forest like like flushing game. Are you? you I'm, you've probably seen that before. Mm -hmm. So they just walk in a big a line basically, but they spread out, you know, maybe a hundred feet apart or more, and they just keep walking through the forest. And as they're walking, they're they're smacking sticks on trees. They're they're hitting hitting the, the brush and the, the bushes, and they're 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 basically flushing out anything in the woods. Like every animal is getting flushed out, and when they do that. They have, you know, one or two hunters with bows or spears or whatever ready to, to whatever it flies up or runs out or whatever. That's what it was like. Like they were coming down to the river, and as I'm listening to this, that's when it, you know, I'm 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 definitely freaking out at this point, Miguel. I mean, I was very nervous, very concerned that we were going to get attacked. That these things were going to come right down to the river. And I am a believer in God. I, I was praying continually for protection around our, our campsite. And that is right when, as these things got probably within, I don't know, 40, probably 40 feet from our, our actual campsite, 
the two closest ones to us were, were probably 40 feet away. We had a deer, a deer jump out of the woods and land right inside of that little water hole directly behind the, um, the, the tent there where the, where the frogs were. Now, as these things got closer, the frogs shut up. Like the frogs were making a lot of croaking at first, but as these things got closer and closer, the frogs went silent. Like they just stopped croaking completely. Well, this deer jumps out of the woods right behind us and it lands in that little water hole. And this thing is wheezing, Miguel. I don't know if I ask you, did, have you ever been, have you ever had the wind knocked out of you, Miguel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you, well, I mean, I'm, I'm talking like when you get punched hard in the gut and you get like a, hey, 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 kind of like that where you can't, you can't even catch your breath. That's what this deer was doing, Miguel. It was so out of breath. It was like wheezing. And at this point, I was scared. I was actually terrified because I'm thinking, okay, now I know what's going on. These things are flushing animals down here to the river, and there is nowhere to go. So they, I, I think what they do, Miguel, is they, they, they flush the animals down to the river, and then they ambush them because there's nowhere to go. The only thing you could do would be to jump in that river, and, and that river's deep. Where I camp at, it's deep. It's way over my head. And once you go across the other side, it's, I don't know how deep it is. It's well over, I'd say probably 10 feet minimum. So there's nowhere for this deer or any other animal to go. They're, they're trapped. And I think that's what they do. They, they flush these animals all the way down to the river and then they, they get them, ambush them. So this deer is directly behind our tent. It's wheezing and it's breathing. Like it's, it's trying to catch its breath. You can just hear it like struggling to try to, it was winded. It was so, you, you can almost fear, feel the, the, the terror in this deer. Like it was just freaking out and it was trying to catch its breath. And at that point, I woke my son up and I'm like, I, I think we're going to get attacked. And I, I want my son to be aware, awake and aware of what's going on in, ca in case we do get attacked. Um, so I woke him up. And as soon as I woke him up, the first thing he said, Dad, he's like, Dad, what is that sound? And I said, it, it's a deer. It's, it's wheezing. And I said, do you hear the beats, the sticks? And he's like, yeah. I said, whatever's out there is flushing and chasing this deer. It just came into our camp. And it is laying right, right behind our tent here. And it's, it's out of breath. It's been running from whatever's in the forest. And so he's laying there with me. We're both listening to these sounds. And uh, again, I had already started recording these things. I, in between texting my wife and praying and, and, and recording, I, I got some very good audio. I think there's 16 different clips that I sent you. And when you listen to these things, you're going to be able to hear them. You're going to be able to tell. I recommend you and your audience, close your eyes and put some put like uh, earphones on so you can really focus on the sounds. And you'll be able to, to distinguish the distances between them. You, you can tell in the recordings that they're far apart. Um, and so, so anyways, this deer jumps in, the, in our campsite and it is wheezing and, and you could just hear it like trying to catch its breath after probably i don't know three minutes or so it, it, it finally started to like breathe like it, it, it was starting to catch its breath but it was still like labored breathing like it was still like you could hear it like still taking deep hard breath, breaths like it was still it was still scared but still like winded and it finally got to a point where it was able to catch its breath and then it, it you could still hear it moving a little bit, but it was like so silent. Like the deer was trying trying to be quiet. It's like if you were running running away from something and you don't want to, you don't want to be heard. That's exactly what was going on. This deer was like terrified, and it was trying to keep quiet. It was trying to stay still and not be noticed or not be heard. And you could hear it I mean, when it would even like take a step. It was like a so quiet, soft step. Like it was trying with everything it could to just quietly get the hell out of there. Like he was trying to, to get out, move away. And you could hear it take one step at a time. And it was so quiet, so like soft steps. But the uh, at, at a certain point, they stopped. The, the beats didn't stop beating, but they didn't advance anymore. They like they came to the like wood line, but they didn't advance. They didn't step out onto the rock bar. They were still there in the woods, but they were like in their position. Now, here's the crazy thing, uh, Miguel. Like they, I, this is what I believe. I believe when they their 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 stick uh, beats together is actually their like that's their their signal. Like if you and I were hunting in the woods and I wanted to know where you are, 
you might have a, a four beat pattern, like one, two, three, four. And mine is a one, two, three. And maybe if we had another part, partner with that hunting, they might have a, a one, two, like a two beat. And that's how we know where Miguel is, where James is, where Bob is, or where we know where each other are just because of the beats. But every once in a while, Miguel, if you, when you guys listen to these audios, these clips, once in a while, you'll hear like an erratic pattern. Well, I, I think what that is, is where they're actually like communicating, like, like a signal. Like the one, two, three, four beats is more like just their, their, their personal uh, call sign, if you were, their, their call signal. But every once in a while, you would hear like a, an irregular, like almost like a, a rhythm, a, a different rhythm. And I think that was like, um, like they're communicating, like, like move forward or, or stop or advance or, you know, like, like signals. So it wasn't just the continual beating. Every once in a while, you would hear like a, an actual rhythm, if you will. Um, so I think that there was one that was bigger than the rest. And it had, I think, a little one with it because I heard like small sticks, like the most of the stick beats are like really hard, like loud beats. Like you'll hear it in the recordings. The, the beats, there, there, I think there was an alpha one, like a very distinct alpha, because there was one set of beats. And when you listen to these recordings, if you listen close, you're going to be able to, you'll hear it. There's one that sounds like it's got a lot bigger sticks than the other ones. Because the, the, when those sticks were getting smacked together, it's so much louder. Like, it just strong, it sounds like a stronger, more powerful beat. And in that same location, Miguel, there was a little, like, smaller, like a sticks. The sticks were, were definitely smaller. And, you, again, you'll be able to hear this. I, I think it was a young one with the alpha because they were coming from the same location where, where, that, where those beats, those two were coming from. I think the alpha or the father, whatever, had a young one with it. And I think it was teaching it, like take, taking it hunting. That's what I think it was doing. Because you would hear the little sticks like, hitting together, and then you would hear the whack, 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 the really powerful one in the same location. And then after a while, the, uh, the little one, I, what I believe was a little one, it, it, it was like it was trying to mimic the, the, the alpha. It, was, it would try to, try to hit its sticks in the same pattern but it was not regular. It was like, it was irregular. So you could tell it sounded like in my, to me that like this little one was trying to mimic the, the alpha, but it didn't have the coordination or the strength to do it. So you would hear like these little clack, 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 clack. And we like, not even like the, the alpha would be one, two, three, four, just real hard, real fast. And you'd hear like the little one, like crack, 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 crack. like it was trying to do the same thing. And then about probably, I don't know, once they stopped advancing, once they just kind of got in their positions and stayed there, that little one, I heard it make like a little sound, like a young voice. And it, it was definitely not like words. It was like a, well, yeah, yeah, something like that. It was like a three syllable, like, well, yeah, yeah, sound. And right after that, I heard that big one, the alpha or whatever it was, the father, whatever, it took its sticks and it hit a tree, like a drum roll, like, it, like a, I, I would compare it to like a snare drum. I don't know if you ever played drums or not. I, I played played a little bit. So if you know what a drum roll is, right? Yeah, I do. Okay. That's what it did. So the little one made that little murmur sound. And then right after that, I hear a just like that on the tree. So I think the father was communicating to the other ones that we're, we're out. We're going home or something because... After that happened, Miguel, I never heard that big alpha male smack again. Never heard that one, and I never heard the little one again. So it was almost to me like the young one was either getting impatient or complaining or whatever, and then like the father was like, we're out of here. Because when he went Rap! on the tree real hard, that's it. Nothing. That, silent, that, that area went silent. And just so you know, that was the farthest one upriver from, from all six locations. It was the farthest one upriver. And once, once that one disappeared or stopped went silent i never heard it heard anything come from that location again the other five still kept beating like smack 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 they just kept on doing it and when you listen to these recordings you're going to hear them like almost like they were it, it felt like to me miguel like they were actually trying to like pump each other up because you would hear like a smack 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 
and then you hear like a smack, smack, and you hear like one go. Whack. It's like they were, I don't know, it's like they were trying to communicate, but at the same time, like motivate each other. Like it was like dad's gone, junior's gone, now it's us, let's go. You know, like like it's like they were kind of riling each other up, and you'll you'll hear that if you pay attention, you'll you'll hear that. It's like like they would almost like smack at the same time. Like one would be doing the, like their four beat, and the other one like chime in with like smack, 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 smack. They would start cracking them like off. Oh, it, it felt to me, Miguel, like they were trying to rile each other up to come on in. That's what I was believe. I believe what was going on. I was praying. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was like, God, please, <laughs> please, please protect us. Please keep, you know, put, put some protection around. I just kept saying it over and over and over, praying in my head, like, please. And I think that I think that's why they stopped. I, I want to, you know, I believe, <laughs> I believe in my heart that's what happened. That there was protection put around our camp. They got all the way to that point, and for whatever reason, they stopped. They didn't. They didn't go away, and they didn't stop beating. In fact, Miguel, they did this clear up until the sun started coming up. It was it was over three hours from the time that that owl woke me up till we finally were, were brave enough to get out of the tent, pack up our stuff, and get the heck out of there. It was over three hours. Um, it, it was already lightened up outside. Like when we got on the river. You could still hear two of them. I think the other ones had given up and, and left, but there were still two that were still like occasionally every like 30 seconds or even a minute or two would go by and you hear smack and you hear a smack, smack. So there, there was still two of them. And when we got in that river and shoved off and pushed off, I, I told my son, I said, paddle hard. Get, we're going to get to the left side of the river. And we are not going to get off that left side of the river until we get at least a, a good half mile down the river. There's no way. I don't want to be anywhere near the, near the right side of the river because that's where they were. And so we, when we finally got all of our gear packed up, I, would, I wouldn't let my son out of my sight. I, I told him, I was like, you stay right by me the whole time. Don't, don't dare walk near the woods. You stay right here near the camp and right here near the, the canoe. I'm like, don't, don't walk away from me. And he's a 14-year-old kid, but I'm, I don't care. <laughs> I was so concerned that those things would step out of that woods and just snatch him. So anyways, we finally got everything packed up, Miguel. Uh, we paddled hard, got to the left side of the river. And uh, right there, as soon as you shove off from our, our, our campsite, that's where the uh, cave spring is on the left. So we, we got right over there beside the cave and just kept on paddling down the left side of the river. We got down probably a couple hundred, hundred yards and you could still hear them. It's, it's like they were following us. You can still hear the, the woods cracks or the beats in the woods on the right side of the river. So we, you know, my son was like on high alert. He kept turning around looking at me because he he, paddle, he paddles in the front of the canoe and I steer in the rear. And he turned around, he looked at me, he said, Dad, they're still, they're still out there. He's like, I know, just, just keep paddling. And we, we did not get off that left side of the bank or the left side of the river for a, easily, easily a half mile. Once we got... We went through a couple of rapids and a couple of uh, turns in the river. Then I felt a little more comfortable to like get out in the middle of the river, but I, I still would not get anywhere near that right side. Um, and we got the heck out of there, man. We got, to, we got out of there. Um, I, I will still go can, canoeing out there, but there, I will not go camping out there anymore, Miguel. Not, not after that. So. Yeah. I don't blame you. That's my experience. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that with me. And um, do you think the Sasquatch were possibly hunting deer in that river valley, and um, that deer ran absolutely. into your guys' campsite? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that that's their hunting grounds. I think that they live up there in the Sunklands area because it's a protected natural area where nobody can go in there except for campers, mm. like hikers. That's it. I think I think they live there. Um, are you familiar with Sunklands natural area? I've looked at it on a map, but I've never been there. Okay, so what it is, because your audience will definitely want to know this, it is a giant sinkhole. It's like a mile-long sinkhole. The whole land collapsed in that valley. The whole thing is a giant sinkhole. So it has caves. It has natural springs. It has old virgin timber growth in it. It's like it's like Missouri... <laughs> Like Missouri was 200 years ago, before it got logged out. It's 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 still in its pristine, uh, virgin state. Beautiful forest, thick 
thick brush, old growth. I mean, it's, but the whole valley is a, it's a giant sinkhole. So it's riddled with caves. It's got all kinds of um, massive, like oaks, hickories, pine. Um, it's, it's just an untouched piece of land. But I believe, Miguel, that they live in that, that area. I think that's their home. And that park literally comes all the way down to the current river. If you look at it on a map, you're going to see where the current river kind of just snakes around the bottom of it. And there is a section there on the lower end of the park where it has like a, a pie shape or like a pizza, pizza cut, like a pizza slice that kind of comes down to the river. And I think that's where they flush these animals. I think they come down out of that sunk lens area. So it's a high ground. I think they come down to the, the river flats and I think they flush the game all the way to the river. And I think they catch them. That's, that's what I think they're doing. Yeah, it very well could be. And I appreciate you sharing that with me. Um, that's pretty close to yep. an area that I've researched at before. And, um, yeah, it's pretty vast wilderness out there and a person could easily get lost. Without a doubt. Okay. So yeah, that whole, the whole area is just, it's, it's, it's pristine for us. It's, it, and like I said, there's no way in, there's no way out except by canoe. That's it. You can hike, hike on trails, but there is no road access anywhere near that spot. So go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Um, so you think the Sasquatch were knocking to communicate with each other and to keep in touch with one another? I think they do both. I think that as they're walking through the forest, they're, they're drumming or they're beating together like one, two, three, four is like their own individual signal, their own individual sign, if you will. And but but at the same time, as they're moving through the forest, I think that at certain points during their their flushing of the, the, the wildlife of the game, I think that they they do additional like beats, it, not just their normal one, two, three, four. But I think they also do like what, 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 what. And I think when they do that, it's it's like they're communicating, like like move forward or stop or you know like a, it's like a signal, like they're actually communicating. I, so I think they do both, Miguel. I think that they are they have a signal that's their own individual signal, but I also think that they're they communicate. In addition to that, make sense? Yeah, it does. And um, this was by Alley Springs or um Cave Springs area. Cave Spring, Cave Spring. It's it's literally a cave on the current river that is so big that you can actually paddle a canoe up into the cave. That's how big it is. Like it's, it's a, I sent you links so you can pull it up and take a look at some of the images. Um, it's a really popular spot on the river for people to stop and like get out and swim because the water is so cold and it's just blue. It's a beautiful, clean water coming up out of the, out of the cave. And I, I want to say the cave is like, the, or the spring that comes up out of the out of the ground i think it's like over i'm gonna say 100 100 feet or maybe even 200 feet it's deep you can't like when you go in there with a with your flashlight and in, in your canoe and you shine that your light down into the the, the uh, spring you can't even see bottom it just turns blue it's so deep but anyways it's a very popular spot that cave spring people during the daytime you know almost everybody will stop and either swim a little bit or at least get out and take pictures because it's a beautiful, a beautiful spot on the river. And so during the daytime, this place is like packed. Like there'll be sometimes, you know, 50 or maybe even more people at a time stopping at this location just to like get out and take pictures and splash around a little bit and get back in the canoe and keep on going. But at nighttime, it's the opposite. It's dead silent. There's nobody around unless you're a camper like primitive camping right there on the river yeah and at any point did you feel in danger whenever these things were coming in absolutely i felt terrified as they as they came closer and closer i thought they were going to come all the way into the camp and when that deer jumped in the water behind the the tent man my i (laughs) miguel literally my heart i almost felt like it just dropped into my stomach like it i felt nauseous i felt like i I was like, you know, you know, that fight or flight, uh, like feeling it, it kicked in like immediately, like, Oh, here, here we go. You know? So that's why, that's why I woke up my son immediately when that deer jumped in that behind the, our tent. 
I woke him up because I, I thought, here we go. They're going to come all the way in on this. They're going to come after that deer and we might get attacked. So I was absolutely terrified at that point. And there's nothing you can do. There's nowhere to go. You can't, even if you jump in your canoe and tried paddling away, you're not going to get very far. I mean, the canoe, <laughs> I mean, I, I could catch you. You know what I mean? I could swim after you and catch you myself. You're not going to escape. There's nowhere to go. There's no, you can't hop in your car and drive off. You can't call 911. You can't, there's nothing. You're on your own out there, completely isolated. And that's why I was, I was terrified because I got my son there with me. And, uh, you know, I put us, I put us in that, in that scenario. I put us at risk. And it was, um, it was terrifying. I, I would have gone down swinging, but that, that, that's not going to do much. <laughs> if you got six of these things coming at you, yeah, good luck. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, was this the same area that you and your daughter had an experience at where you heard the vocalization? Yes. Uh, Miguel, I camp at the exact same spot every year. It's always the same spot. It's the same exact location. You're you're kind of diagonal from the, the cave itself, from the cave spring, but you're you're within a probably 200 yards of the opening of the cave, but you're on the opposite side of the river on a rock bar. And yes, same spot that my daughter and her friend where we where I experienced or heard the uh, well, something walking across the, the river. This is one of the areas that David Politis covered and talked about a missing hunter that they ended up finding. Did you ever hear that story? Really? No, I did not. I'm curious. So I've, what, what can you tell me about it? Because after hearing those gunshots up there coming from that state park, that's definitely, definitely piques my interest. Yeah. Well, um, I can only relay what I heard and I don't even know if I have the facts straight, but, um, a guy went hunting out there by himself in the Ozark national scenic riverway area. And, um, I think one of his buddies dropped him off and they never um, found him again. So they had like this search team go out there and they looked all over the area and didn't find anything. And I believe when they showed up the second or third day, the body was right there where they initially started at. And um, they tried saying that he went looking for the buck that he shot and he crossed the river, but he never took his gun with him. And, um, I don't know. I think it might've been one of those cases where like his clothes was missing and stuff like that. Just really strange. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I feel like if he would have well, went across the river to go look for a buck that he shot, he would have took his gun with him, not left it behind. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just, just out of the, uh, you know, mercy for the animal, you know, if, if you, if you wounded it, and it's not dead. You're going to want to put a kill shot in it, you know, just out of mercy. Um, so, or, you know, you could walk up on it. It could still be, you know, very much alive and it could charge you. So, yeah, I would definitely say you would take your, your gun with you either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was cold out and they, they said that he tried crossing the river and got hyperthermia and had to sleep out there all night. So who knows what really happened, but, um, the story that they told doesn't seem to line up with the locals around there and everybody says something's not right with that situation. Okay. So, so what was, what was actually wrong with his body? I mean, was he, he had like a broken neck or was there any injuries or anything? Do you know? I'm not really sure. I mean, I never really heard the full report, just um, what David Plyta said about it and um, what I'd seen on the internet, but I never heard much about it again. Well, I'll tell you that the after hearing those screams and roars and then the gunshots, I actually thought within a day or two I was going to hear something like in the local news or something that somebody either went missing or got shot or hurt or something, but nothing. I never heard a thing. So I, I don't know. I don't know what to, to think about that whole situation, but that was around six years ago. So if, if there was any way to do some research and find that if there was missing persons in that park, that might might uh, put two and two together for their family because um all i know is it was extremely loud the scream and roar and then followed by two gunshots after that second roar that something went down that's all i know miguel something actually happened up there 
So, and the fact that we never heard anything after that, not a scream, nothing, nothing, just silence, you know, makes you wonder what, what happened. Somebody, did they actually get attacked or did they, you know, I've heard so many stories that where people will pop off a shot at one of these things and they, they immediately retaliate, like come after you. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe one got shot at or, um, they were just trying to spook them away or something. But, um, no, it just hit me that I think I've hunted in the skunk lands conservation area before because I hunted in an area in Summersville, Missouri. And, um, I went past like the little post office there on a highway called like highway Y or YY. And, um, it took me into the conservation area, but yeah, I, I've hunted there before. I guess I just never realized it. I thought it was just Mark Twain or something. No, it's sunk lands, S U N K sunk like sunk lands and they call it sunk lands because it literally is it's a it's a giant sinkhole so it's just the whole land is like collapsed the whole ground just collapsed you know who knows how long ago but it's a very uh a very big park it's over forty thousand acres yeah so you um, could drive a long ways through that park and um still not see everything mm -hmm. well literally miguel I, I sent you a link um it is it has been declared the most remote location in the state of Missouri. It is. It's it is the most remote. So there's like not only is it uh you know, there's no roads and things, but it's literally the most remote. So you know, just to access it, you have to hike in or, you know, walk into it. There's like wild horses out there and it's pretty wild. Yes. A lot of bear, elk, yeah. giant hogs. It's yeah, it's wild. Oh yeah, we got mountain lions and everything out here. Bear, black bear, razorbacks, they're, they're, everything's over here. And elk too. I mean, we got elk now. It's it's pretty awesome. Yeah. And um, Sasquatch as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Yeah, it's a it's a wild area, and it kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies being down that far in Missouri. I mean, by myself, anyways. If I had a group of people, it probably wouldn't be that bad. But um. That's the feeling I got whenever I was down there hunting. And um, it seems like there's a lot of people that like to run dogs down there. And I don't know if they're chasing after mountain lions or bears. But, um, yeah, some of those dogs you wouldn't want to run into. No. No, these are there's quite a bit of, of hunters that, that go down in that area. So it's definitely not something, a place you want to go by yourself. You always want to have a buddy with you if you're going to go hunting or even fishing on the river just definitely suggest going with somebody but yeah. i would not suggest camping at, at cave spring <laughs> i would not suggest that to anybody um you know I've, I've camped out there so many times miguel that and i've never had a terrifying experience like this uh, but it's changed me and my son was immediately like i'm not going back out there dad <laughs> i was like i understand you know <laughs> i'd still like to go canoeing with you but i'm never going to ask you to go camping out there again so um, yeah. it was a terrifying experience. I mean, he's, he, what was really crazy, Miguel, is like afterwards, it, you know, in the, like my son said, we, we talked about, we've, we've had probably two or three conversations now since this happened over a month ago, where we're both just kind of like thinking about like what could have happened and being so grateful that it didn't, because in the moment you're just thinking about getting through the night, just getting through the night and getting the heck out of there. But afterwards, when you have time to reflect on it, and so you think about every step of the process that that owl was like literally calling out to the forest, like run, you know, go, here they come, here they come. And that's what that owl was doing. It was trying to alert the forest, here, here they come. And then you got the frogs mimicking the exact same sounds. I think the frogs thought that they were hearing frogs at first and they were just responding to the, the, the beats because they were so far out in the forest that they almost sounded like the frog croak at first. But as they got closer and closer, you could definitely tell it was sticks, like wood getting hit on wood. And that's when the frogs got quiet. I think the frogs like realized, like, whoa, wait a minute, that's, that's not a frog. And they, so they stopped. They, they went silent. And then you got the deer. <laughs> the deer was actually being hunted, like flushed down through the river. And I, I, I personally, Miguel, I think the deer had the sense to come to us. For protection that's what i believe i've heard other people's accounts where uh, a hunter be like in their deer stand and a deer will run right up to their their tree look right up look look the hunter right in the eyes and lay down right next to them for protection 
Now, that's crazy to me because if a deer he knows that you're hunting it, why would it come to you for protection unless it's absolutely terrified of what's, what's out there, what's coming after it, what's chasing it? So I believe that's what happened, Miguel, that this deer had the, uh, the intelligence to come to the humans and stay, stay with us. And it, it stayed there. It, it was probably a good 20 minutes before it, I finally heard it. Like you could hear it slowly, like stepping away quietly. I don't know what happened. I don't know if they, ever, if they caught the deer. I never heard it squealing or screech, you know, screaming. So I don't know. Maybe it got away. Maybe it didn't. But I do know that it went north. It went, it went, it went up river. That was the direction I could hear it walking away. So it went north uh, up river where that we're at what I believe the alpha and the young one were. It went that direction. But I never, I never heard it screaming. I never heard it get attacked or anything. Just, just these things beating on those sticks for three freaking hours. Uh, when you listen to these recordings, Miguel, um, there, I can't really even tell you like what order they're in. I, it, when you start hearing like the birds waking up, those would have been the, the later ones. But when you hear, when you listen to those recordings and the ones that are just the constant beating of the sticks and you hear multiple going off at the same time, those would have been the earlier ones. Because as the daylight started to come on and the wildlife in the forest started to wake up, you could hear the crows, you could hear the uh, squirrels starting to chatter. When that happened, that's when they started fading, like the, the, the beating. Like, I think that one by one, they started giving up on the hunt and w went home. But there was, as I told you, there were still two that were still occasionally beating even after we were on the water leaving. So these things are very dedicated. To the to the hunt, they don't they don't give up easy. I mean, that's three hours, Miguel. Three hours, crazy. Yeah, it does sound like they were hunting that night, and um, it sounds like they were going all night long. So, um, you listened to this all all night, and it kept you up till the morning time. <laughs> yeah, like I said, about three forty five is when it started, and I know that for a fact because when I started texting my wife, it was. It was probably around four. It was just after four when I started texting her because I, I lay there for a good 20 minutes just listening to all this stuff happening and like just thinking, you know, what's going to happen. I started getting – the more nervous I got, Miguel, that's when I decided – I'm like, man, I need to be – I need to at least attempt to, to let her know what's going on in case we get hurt or killed or go missing or whatever. I, I wanted something. Did your text I, you know, go so through? I, that's why I started texting her. Uh, the next day, Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. since you're familiar with that area, the, the, the next location on that river where you can actually get a signal is near a, a large, uh, campground called Pultite. And as we, as we went by or floated by Pultite, we got a little bit of a signal and that's when they started firing off. Uh, my wife picks us up at uh, round spring. That's where we finish our float round spring. So she started getting these texts, but it came to her like all out of order. And so it was just randomly sending. I'm sure you've had that happen before. You're you had a you're in a location where you had no signal at all, and then when you finally get to an area where you have a signal, your phone just starts randomly firing off those texts. And so they're not even in order anymore. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you, you might get the, the, the last you might get the last text first. Mm -hmm. When I camp in those areas, um, my messages never go out. I'll get some text messages, but I realize as I'm driving closer to home. Um, I start getting a bunch of text messages and notifications as I'm getting closer and closer to home. So, um, yeah, okay. signal d definitely doesn't work out there, but I've heard that, um, like the newer Apple phones, they ha they work off of GPS. So even if you have like zero signal, your text messages are still going through. I'm thinking about switching, but I'm not sure yet. I got you. Well, my whole family has apples. I I'm the only one that uses an Android, <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. I, okay. I don't know. That's, uh, I'm happy with what I got. But yeah, well, James, I think so, that pretty well questions? covers. No, I think that pretty well covers your story, and um, you were answering all the questions I had written down as you were going through the experience. So yeah. I, I really appreciate that, and I appreciate you taking the time to get in contact with me and to openly share everything here on the channel. Not a problem, brother. I just hope that uh, the whole point in this. Honestly, Miguel, 
I, I know a lot of people go camping out there and, and fishing and canoeing. I just want to make sure <laughs> they are aware that there's a possibility that there's something out there in that woods that you don't want to deal with. Um, so if at the very minimum, I hope somebody will, will hear this and uh, take precautions, whatever that may be on their own part, whether it's, you know, bringing a, a protection with you or maybe avoiding that area camping. I, that's all I care about, Miguel. I want, I, I hope that this helps somebody. Um, maybe they've had an experience. Maybe they didn't really think about it, didn't understand what was going on. Um, so that, that's my sincere hope from my, from my heart that, that this will make somebody, somebody out there aware and uh, maybe, maybe protect somebody and avoid maybe getting hurt. So stay clear of uh, Cave Spring at nighttime, folks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I appreciate you for sharing that and um, your willingness to help yep. people. I'll keep in touch with you and I'll follow up with you to see if maybe you want to go there for um for a day during the day um you know maybe you want yeah, to tell your I would, story i would be or... willing to, to yeah i'd be willing to take you out there um my wife she would just you could come here to my home and then uh we would just you know dr she would actually drive us out there and then we would float and she'll come pick us up at probably pull tight because i am not gonna i'm not gonna camp out there anymore miguel so mm -hmm. um but we, we could definitely make that happen. We could do it. We just do like an early float and you, you'd be more than welcome to stay here at our home overnight. If you want to come down like in the evening, stay the night. And then we just get up in the morning and hit, hit the water early, probably, you know, eight, nine in the morning. And that would give us plenty of time to get to that spot where you could actually film and record and, you know, document whatever you want. And then we still have plenty of time to get to, uh, the pickup spot at, at pole tight. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good to me. And, um, yeah, just let me know and keep in touch. I will. I appreciate you taking the time just to, to listen and share it with the audience. So, yeah, it's no problem. Have a good day, brother. Yeah, you too. And I'm going to check out that audio. So, I'll let you know what I hear. And yep. you have an excellent day, sir. You too. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. No problem. Take care, man. Bye. Bye. All right. That's another Bigfoot report from the Current River Conservation Area. And I appreciate you, James, for sharing your experience with everyone. If you guys enjoy listening to Sasquatch Theory, please like and subscribe. And if you have a Bigfoot or Cryptid encounter that you would like to share, please contact me at sasquatchtheory at outlook.com. If you guys would like to help support the channel, you can purchase some merchandise on my Spreadshop website. Also add me on social media such as X, Instagram, Facebook, Rumble, and SoundCloud. Alright, I hope you guys have a good one. Take care and God bless.